So let's get started. Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining today's panel. Time for a rewrite, telling women's stories in news media on Wikipedia and beyond. I'm Anusha Ali Khan, the Senior Director of Communications at the Wikimedia Foundation, the nonprofit organization that operates Wikipedia and other free knowledge projects. For this Women's History Month, Wikimedia launched Project Rewrite to call attention to the persistent gender gaps on Wikipedia, the missing representation of cis and transgender women, and we want to ask everyone to help close them. We're also recognizing through the initiative that Black and Indigenous women and women of color in particular have been most often left out of history. While the problem persists on Wikipedia, the solution involves changes both on and off Wikipedia. Journalists, academics, thought leaders, and individuals and organizations must increase their coverage of women, building out the ecosystem of secondary sources and literature that Wikipedians rely on to create and improve articles on the site. We're excited to be co-hosting this event with the George Washington University School of Media and Public Affairs, which is training new leaders in journalism and communication. Our hope is that today's panel will provide everyone with the tools and knowledge to further advance the representation of women through their work. Today, we'll be hearing from incredible women from journalism, academia, and the nonprofit sector. Each will be delivering a brief talk followed by a panel conversation. At the end, we'll welcome questions from the audience. Please hold your questions until the Q&A and please submit your questions using the Q&A box. To begin today's conversation, it's my pleasure to introduce Janine Uzel, the Chief Operating Officer at the Wikimedia Foundation. Prior to joining Wikimedia, Janine was Head of Women in Technology at GE and worked to accelerate the number of women in technical roles. Welcome, Janine. Hello. Thank you so much, Anusha, and welcome, everyone. Thank you all for joining us on today. I am thrilled to be joined by the women on this panel experts in their fields to talk more about the unequal representation of women across our information landscape and what we can do to take action. As the Chief Operating Officer of the Wikimedia Foundation, this is an issue that is deeply personal to me. As a woman, as a Black woman, I am intimately familiar with the, with the feeling of being the only uh, in the rooms that I enter. I like to paraphrase a quote from Shonda Rhimes where I often feel like the first, the only, and the different. When I began my career as an engineer, there were so few role models to look up to in my field and even fewer that I could read about. Thankfully, things have improved since then. My youngest great niece, her name is Kennedy with an I, as she likes to say, she's six years old. And depending on the day, she wants to be a physicist, a doctor, an engineer like me, an astronaut, the list just goes on. She's seen women in these roles, women that look like her, and she can see herself there. So I'm thrilled for Kennedy, and I love to hear what her latest dream job is. She's proof that as a society, we've made some progress, but we also need to recognize that we still have ways, a ways to go. And this is very apparent in the work that I do every day. As Anusha mentioned, the Wikimedia Foundation is the global nonprofit that supports Wikipedia, as well as several other projects, all dedicated to free knowledge. The scale of Wikipedia is immense. It's almost overwhelming. More than 55 million articles across 300 different languages were edited by more than 280,000 volunteers every month. We're visited over 20 billion times a month and accessed in terms of unique devices by 1.5 billion every month. And I love, I love to compare that to Instagram, which I'm a fan of, used by 1 billion users a month. And yet, on Wikipedia, we see the lack of representation in staggering proportions. Of all the biographies on English Wikipedia, only 18% of them are biographies about women. Now that is not representative of the impact that women have had across human history. But for many of us here, maybe that number isn't so surprising. We all know of women whose achievements have never been recognized. For some of the amazing women throughout history, their achievements may never have been recorded. But I wanna say that this isn't just a Wikipedia problem. The gender gaps on Wikipedia are a mirror 
of gaps in our own society, subjects that the media hasn't found worthwhile to cover and that the industry as a whole hasn't found worthwhile to recognize. And, and I don't mean this to pass the buck. I firmly believe that we all have a responsibility here to advocate for increased representation across our fields, to point out the iniquities from a mantle with a token female moderator to an article that only cites male experts. In addition to these small actions, we must also raise awareness about the urgent need for systemic change. Within the Wikimedia Foundation, we are taking steps to make our projects more welcoming and more inclusive of the world that we serve. Last month, we introduced for the first time a universal code of conduct across Wikipedia and all of our projects. It is rooted in Wikimedia's values of respect, civility, and the assumption of good faith. It is a set of fundamental standards that provide Wikipedia's global volunteer communities with a baseline for acceptable behavior. The Universal Code of Conduct outlines, excuse me, the type of online harassment and abuses of power that can happen on our projects and also ways to address them. I believe it is a critical and important step in creating an environment that is more welcoming to a more diverse range of contributors and editors. We are all supporting the work of our communities, many of whom have spent years focusing on this issue. Groups like WikiGap, Wiki Women in Red, Invisible Wiki Women. And all of us on this panel are leaders in our field. And we may be a few on this panel here, but if we're successful, we will leave a rich legacy for other women to carry and build upon. Together, we can change the scale of the gender gap. We can change how women are talked about and perceived as leaders and as innovators and as experts. So that's my introduction. I wanna say thank you all for coming. And I'd like to introduce all of our speakers and they're gonna share a lightning talk about their work to improve gender equality. We're gonna be hearing from Emily Ramshaw, a journalist and co-founder of The 19th, Kira Wisniewski, the executive director of Art and Feminism, a Wikimedia community focused on gender, feminism and the arts, and to kick things off, we're going to hear from Dr. Rebecca Trombull. Dr. Trombull is the director of the George Washington University Institute for Data, Democracy, and Politics. Her research focuses on political communication, digital research methodology, and research ethics. She is currently leading research projects that investigate the health of political conversations on Twitter and develop computational tools that will allow researchers to analyze and assess the quality of online news content. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Trumbull. I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you so much for, for having me. Um, and you know, I want to kick things off just by um, thanking everyone in the audience for being here, but of course, this, this group of esteemed panelists. Um, it's really my honor to, to be with you today. Um, but I think, unfortunately, I have to start us off in a fairly dark place, in a fairly heavy place, um, because I spend a lot of time looking at the darkest, the ugliest places online. Um, I, as a researcher, um, my focus is on disinformation, as well as hate speech, online harassment, abuse, essentially every form of toxicity um, online that, that one might imagine. Um, and what I see and what the data that I gather and my colleagues gather on these issues shows very, very clearly is that these dark impulses have a disparate impact on women. Um, these dark impulses are disproportionately directed at women. And the consequence is that women are silenced online in very real observable ways. Um, I think probably many of us on this panel, as well as in the audience, um, could speak quite directly of experiences that we've had of uh, self-censoring, um, of thinking to ourselves, you know, very carefully, um, is this something that it's safe for me to post? Um, if, if, if I post this, you know, am I going to see a wave of, of trolls come after me? And we think about those things in very different ways than our male colleagues do, unfortunately. 
Um, a lot of women ultimately choose to limit their reach online, doing things like increasing their privacy settings, um, turning their accounts entirely private. So it's only on, on social media um, sites, they can only reach those that they directly follow or have reciprocal relationships with. And ultimately that means women's voices are not reaching larger audiences. And of course, many women are just making the choice to completely disengage, either going to a platform and simply observing um, and not directly making their voice heard or simply choosing to leave those platforms entirely. Um, and there's, a num there's, there's quite a bit of disheartening research, survey research in particular, that suggests that more and more women um, are making those choices. Now, as I say all of this, I want to um, note, right, I've been talking about women broadly here because the, the data, the evidence are very clear that these impacts um, are across the board for all women, but they are also clear that the consequences are most severe for transgender women and women of color. Um, and I think that later in our conversation, we'll move to, uh, to talk through solutions to these things. And I have a number of ideas um, about how I think we can really tackle um, these heavy, heavy issues. But I'm starting off the conversation and, and leading <laughs> to my next colleague to take it up, um, realizing I'm giving a, a fairly grim view uh, of the situation, but it's, it's unfortunately what I see. Thank you so much, Rebecca. This is, you know, what you're sharing is, is so much in line with some of what we're gonna talk a little bit more about with the Universal Code of Conduct, even with what we're learning on our platform that for many years, only about 11% of our editors identified as women. We've seen an increase there of about 15% now, but we also know that that's not reflective of the power of women in media and using their voice. So I, I was taking a lot of notes of, of some of the, the grim but informative details that you're sharing, and I'm looking forward to talking with you more about it. So thank you. I'm going to now introduce Emily Ramshaw. She is a journalist and co-founder of The 19th. The 19th is a nonprofit, nonpartisan newsroom reporting at the intersection of women, politics, and policy. Emily was previously editor in chief of the Texas Tribune, an award winning nonpartisan digital news startup that now boasts of the largest state house reporting bureau in the country. And she is, great, great fun fact here, the youngest member of the board of the Pulitzer Prize. So thank you so much for being here, Emily. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Janine, and thank you all for having me. I'm uh, really thrilled to be uh, with this esteemed group. I'm just going to tell you a little bit um, uh, in, in my quick uh, introduction here about the 19th and the reason that we started the 19th. So we kicked off officially uh, just a little over a year ago um, as the nation's first nonprofit independent newsroom at the intersection of gender, politics, and policy. And so what that meant to us was journalism that aims to elevate the voices, particularly of women of color in the LGBTQ community um, in American media with journalism that is entirely free to read and consume across all of our own platforms, but also entirely free to republish by every other news organization in the country. And we kicked off the 19th Honestly, honestly, this idea first occurred to me, um, you know, uh, in 2016 around uh, Donald Trump's um, election, uh, defeating Hillary Clinton. I was a new mom on maternity leave with a baby girl, and I was reading all these headlines around electability and likability that seemed so fundamentally sexist. And I sort of thought in that moment, um, you know, we need a new national newsroom of record for women. Two thirds of politics and policy reporters are men. Almost all of them are white. Um, two thirds of politics and policy uh, editors uh, are men. Uh, you know, managers are men. Almost all of them are white. They're the ones deciding at the end of the day, what's news and what isn't, um, what stories lead the front page or the home page, which sources are quoted in those stories, whose voices are elevated, who's hired in those newsrooms. Um, and, and I wanted to create um, a solution to that. So, uh, you know, I was on maternity leave. It wasn't, I, I was trying to like keep another human being alive. It wasn't a great time to start a new uh, startup. I decided to wait four years for a pandemic to do that. Uh, excellent timing on all fronts. But, but four years later, we had more women than ever on the 2020 stage, more women of color than ever on the 2020 stage. And the headlines were still about electability and likability, but they were also about, um, is she too ambitious? Does she want it too much? 
um, headlines that were not just sexist to me, but were also rooted in racism. And so we officially, my colleague at the Texas Tribune at the time, Amanda Zamora and I took the leap, um, uh, we're partners in this venture, and we officially in January kicked off the 19th. So we are now a newsroom that is you know, a 24 seven news operation. Um, we officially built our own platforms and launched our own platforms in August of, of 2020. We birthed this baby in a pandemic, a bunch of moms with small kids at home, uh, which was never part of the plan, but made it added to that degree of difficulty. Um, and so now we're an organization that is not just read across platforms, but republished by roughly 260 newspapers every week. Um, Univision translates our work into Spanish and distributes it. We have a really robust live events track with programming that featured, you know, we had a launch summit with everyone from Stacey Abrams and the first sit down interview with Kamala Harris as the VP nominee to a conversation with Meghan Markle, you know, before anybody had even talked to her back in the United, back, getting back in the United States. So it's been a really thrilling ride for us in probably one of the most difficult times in history. Um, and we are excited to be on this journey and elevating the voices of, um, of marginalized people, hopefully forevermore in American media. So that's a little bit about me and the 19th uh, and I'm thrilled to be part of this conversation today. Thank you so much, Emily. This is great. And I would just want to congratulate you and your team for the platform, for being a vehicle for news, and also for the disruption that you're causing in the industry. So well done. Well done. Thank you so much for that. And finally, I'm going to introduce Kira Wisniewski. Kira is the Executive Director of Art and Feminism, which strives to close the information gap about gender, feminism, and the arts on the internet. Since 2014, over 18,000 people have participated in art and feminism edit-a-thons globally, creating and improving more than 84,000 articles on Wikipedia and other Wikimedia projects. Kira is also active in community causes as the host and co-organizer of Creative Mornings Baltimore and co-founder of the nonprofit 826DC. Kira, would you please um, share with us? Yeah, absolutely. So thank you so much, Janine, Anusha, Rebecca, Emily, and for everyone organizing today. Um, thanks to y'all for showing up, all of you attendees. I know like we're living in a world of uh, screen fatigue. We've been doing this for a year. So really like kudos to you for being here and being with us today. Um, so as you just heard, my name is Kara Wisniewski. My pronouns are she, her. I come to you today from occupied uh, Piscataway land in Baltimore City. Um, and before I give you some more grim stats, um, uh, art and feminism, we like to start all of our sessions with our brave friendly space agreement. So even though I am the last of the lightning talks, I still wanted to highlight this. So the goal of this session is to create an encouraging space for collective learning. This requires intentional behavior wherein participants are conscious of and accountable for the effect of their statements and actions on others. We respect our experiences and the experience of others and recognize that we can't do this work without one another. We agree to hold each other accountable to foster a brave, friendly space. And so we have um, a longer version of this. This is kind of the abbreviated version, but it's something that we like to kind of to center all of the sessions that we do either virtually or in person with our work with our and feminism. Um, so now for some more grim stats. <laughs> uh, a 2011 study is really what sparked this whole project. Um, and there was this big article in the New York Times really talking about this gender gap on Wikipedia and it really energized our co-finders. Uh, so unfortunately, according to 2018, uh, Wiki contributor data, this hasn't really changed that much. It's good to hear from Janine that there's some newer stats that are tracking more positive, but in 2018, there was still less than 10% of editors that identify as cis or trans women. Um, and then the editors that do identify as women are more likely than men to have their edits reverted. And so this, this is a problem. Um, next slide, please. So as Janine mentioned, the gaps aren't just on Wiki, but um, so specifically what art and feminism does is we work primarily in the art world, but cis, trans women, non-binary people, the BIPOC communities are also underrepresented in the art world. So here are some facts that are provided by the National Museum of Women in the Arts. 
a data analysis of 18 major US museums found their collections are 87% male and 85% white. And Janssen's Basic History of Western Art, which is kind of like the de facto text for art schools, 8% um, of the list, 300 listed artists are women with less than 1% being women of color, which I guess is a little bit of progress from in the 1980s when there were no women. <laughs> um, and then over 60% of MFA students are women, but galleries only show about 30% women artists. So I know um, Wikipedia might seem really specific, right? But it is, but as kind of as Janine was saying, like the, the reach of Wiki is, is huge. It's the 10th most visited site in the world. Google, which is actually the most visited site in the world, scrapes Wiki. So does your smart devices in your home. If you're talking to Alexa or Siri, it's asking Wiki ultimately. And huge art institutions like the Museum of Modern Art are also looking at Wiki. So when there are absences on Wikipedia, it really echoes throughout the entire internet. Um, next slide, please. So when cis and trans women, non-binary people and the BIPOC communities are not represented in the writing and editing of the 10th most visited site in the world, the information like us gets skewed and misrepresented. The stories get mistold and we lose out on that real history. And so that's why we're here to change it. So what Art and Feminism does is it builds a community of activists that is committed to closing the information gaps related to gender, feminism, and the arts, beginning with Wikipedia. Uh, art and Feminism envisions an internet that reflects diverse global histories of art making, where communities who have most often been written out of history feel welcome and empowered to participate in writing and writing our stories. So um, these, this stat was already shared with you all, but since 2014, over 18,000 people at more than 1,260 events around the world have participated in our edit-a-thons, resulting in the creation and improvement of more than 84,000 articles on Wikipedia and its sister projects. Um, so we really kind of operate in this do it yourself and do it with others campaign. And so from coffee shops, to community centers, to some of the largest museums in the world, uh, we've had events. And so here is just a sampling of some of the, the partners that we've worked with uh, throughout the world. And so with, with that, I will end and look forward to talking more with y'all. Well, thank you, Kira. I'm actually going to give you a chance to talk a little bit more because I'm going to let you um, kind of lead us into the first question that I'm going to propose for the panel. Um, and it's, it's going to be specific to art and feminism. And then I'll go back and, and ask some other questions. Because all of the information that we just heard is both sobering and refreshing. So many perspectives from journalism, academia, and then even our, our Wikimedia movement. Kira, I want to ask you, and you've talked about all the work that art and feminism has been successful at in terms of drawing attention to content gaps for trans and non-binary artists. Can you talk a little bit about how you use language intentionally to be inclusive as well? That's a great question. <laughs> um, we actually just are, we're finishing up right now a really tremendous strategic planning process that we've been partnering with this great um, facilitator who's actually based in DC who really centers a social justice as a lens. Uh, they're called Wayfinding Partners. And they've really helped us kind of fine tune our language because we it is important that when we talk about women, we're not just talking about frankly, white women, we're talking about non-binary folks, we're talking about trans folks, we're talking about all of these communities that are not traditionally centered. Um, we've also been really working on trying not to use the terms underrepresented and marginalized because real, realizing that those terms center whiteness and we're not trying to do that in our work. And so I would say that in terms of our inclusive, our language being inclusive, it's a journey. And it's something that we are constantly talking about and fine tuning, but it's a, it's a great community to be in where we are able to have these conversations about like, what do we mean when we mean, when we say intersectional feminism and like, who are we including and who are we uplifting? And so really kind of trying to center those communities that are not traditionally centered is really where we're trying to base our language and our work. 
Thank you so much, Kira. And I, I know we're gonna get some questions about that. We're gonna circle back afterwards. I'd like to, um, to address a question to Emily and, and Rebecca. I'd like to ask you about opportunities for collaboration. What more, because I know there is more that academia, media and information platforms can do together. Rebecca, do you wanna start? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, this is a, a real priority um, for the work that we do at the Institute for Data Democracy and Politics. Um, because we fundamentally believe any of the, the research, which you know, really is the heart of any academic institution, any research that we're conducting um, is not going to have the impact that's necessary unless we're making sure the public understands what we're finding, unless we're making sure that policymakers understand what we're finding. And the best route to both of those broad audiences is in working directly with journalists. Um, and so we are very mindful of um, and, and directly look for those opportunities to not just share, you know, reach out to a journalist and say, here's an embargoed report, right, that you can take a look at, but rather sit side by side, these days not physically, but sit side by side and conduct some of these investigations together. Um, ensure that the questions that we're asking are guided by a by broader public interest um, and that the the way that we communicate is digestible for a large audience um, and so we can bring a lot of the you know the technical skills to the table um, while working very closely with the journalists on the appropriate framing and storytelling elements of those um, IDDP is very soon um, going to to have a journalist in residence um, on our staff with the idea that we want to create a space for um, journalists to, to be able to tell a longer, deeper story about precisely some of these problems um, and, and you know, then share those, uh, share those with the world. Um, so that's one of the ways that we're looking at it, but there are a number of, of other models for doing this as well. The only thing I'd add to that is that, you know, journalism has for too long been a one way street where you have people sort of in their ivory tower, people who don't represent most of the communities they say they're seeking to serve, um, you know, telling the stories that they think are important. And I think I really think about journalism as a two way street, as a give or take, as we have an obligation to be telling the stories that matter most to our audiences and allowing them to see themselves in the stories that we tell. So from the standpoint of, you know, partnering with organizations or with academia, like, help send us those stories, give us those ideas, you know, whether it's a traditional pitch, whether it's sitting down with the reporter, whether it's just saying, these are the, the, you know, people we're highlighting in our work and we think are deserving of your coverage. These are the trends we're seeing out in the world that we think are worthy of a, an alternative lens. Um, you know, we are constantly in search of uh, great stories to tell and people to, uh, to highlight. And so from that standpoint, I say, I would, I would really think about journalism as a, as a two-way street and as a relationship relationship versus a top-down um, approach. Thank you. Now, we, we talk about Wikipedia being a, a tertiary source and so the importance of other outlets to support uh, the content on Wikipedia, sort of if it happens in the world, it happens on Wikipedia. So with that said, Kira, what would be your dream big uh, for, for Emily and Rebecca and, and places in media and academia? What would you want to see them do in their field, speaking maybe on, on behalf of um, the movement itself? Well, that's a big ask, Janine. <laughs> <laughs> you get to dream big on this panel, because hey, I'm here, so. <laughs> I don't know if I want to speak on behalf of the movement ever, but <laughs> um, Fair enough. I, think, Fair enough. I think a way in which like journalists and academia can really help is by writing about these communities that have traditionally been written out of history. Um, and in that writing, include contemporary artists that aren't showing at the big museums or having you know huge exhibits and art fairs. Um, there are so many incredible, there's so much incredible work that's being created now and has been created in the past and just really trying to uplift those, those communities, those artists are really important. Um, another thing also to think about too is one of the things that we're doing with art and feminism right now is um, there's a research initiative 
that's funded by Wikicred looking at reliable source. I'm about to get real granule, y'all. So sorry. <laughs> so there are reliable source guidelines for Wikipedia, meaning that there are certain sources that are deemed unreliable and therefore can't be used in an article to write an article on Wiki. And so some of those things are oral histories, for instance, like that's not currently considered a reliable source. And so what journalists and academia could do to kind of help the work that we're doing is look at some of those archives, some of those archives that are um, like, like there's a lot of, there's so much archival work, right? Um, but like, look at some of these art collective archives, look at some of these um, and create research and articles from some of these non-traditional sources that will ultimately help the work of art and feminism and Wikipedians get more articles into the universe. <laughs> Not on behalf of the movement, just some, some a response. <laughs> I totally understand the, the, the note there. And uh, so thank you for that. And listen, it, it is, um, it's an ask even um, how you got very specific with contemporary artists and, and that support for art and feminism. So not on behalf of the movement, but certainly on behalf of with the lens of the work that you do. So I appreciate that. And, and in that vein, Emily, I'd really like to ask you about the lens that you take as a journalist and a leader when it comes to telling women's stories. Um, for example, over the past few weeks, taking a look at the 19th, you've shown a spotlight, not just on women, but the renewed recognition of the role of Black women, thank you very much, in advocating for voting rights. So how do you uh, how do you think about this intersectionality within the issues that you cover, um, ensuring that, I know this is a term we, are, we, we struggle with using, but underrepresented or minority voices are also heard. Can you talk about that? Sure. Well, I mean, first of all, put this is obvious to the untrained eye, but um, I am a white woman of privilege speaking, uh, I'm trying to lead an organization that is aimed at elevating the voices of women of color. And so obviously I'm grappling with all of the things that that entails personally and professionally. But I mean, I think the most critical piece for us is that, you know, look, I wasn't, um, when I first thought up the 19th, I was again, like thinking from the standpoint of working mom, you know, white working mom. And then it really became clear to me that uh, over time that white women were certainly not the only ones disproportionately affected by the power of the patriarchy. Uh, you know, it became abundantly clear to us that it wasn't just, and it wasn't just women of color's voices that were missing from the conversation. It was, it was trans non-binary. Uh, it was a much broader swath of, of the population. And so, as we started thinking about the 19th, we started thinking about the ways all of those communities intersect and could we provide a platform that truly elevated those voices. Um, and so, so that's how we think about it. I mean, our newsroom is, you know, 70% um, women of color. We employ one of the only out trans non-binary reporters in the country. Um, it is, you know, you have to have the people who reflect those communities bringing their own lived experiences to work, uh, to their journalism, they need to be the ones telling and owning those stories. And so um, if I can play a, a part in trying to, to level that playing field and to uh, ensure that the voices that have not been heard for far too long are the ones that are elevated front and center, that's, that's the obligation I feel. And that's, I think, just, you know, part of the road to um, evening out the the sort of um, uh, who tells stories and what the national narrative looks like for um, for women in the LGBTQ community. Thank you, thank you for that and for your work, um, Rebecca. I'd really like to to park a question here with you, and we have a few moments before I think we would head into Q and A. We're joined here um, by journalists, students at George Washington, um, folks from academia, different industries. Uh, I'm going to say that everyone that's joined this uh, panel today cares about changing the representation of women in our society. Can you give us um, a call to action um, for such a diverse audience and, and some of what you're working on and what you're seeing and what we might want to be aware of and even consider doing next? Yeah, absolutely. And if, if, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll ground it. Um, really in, in the work that I'm doing and as, as essentially a response to the things that I led um, our conversation with the sort of grim reality that I painted for everyone. Um, I think when I start to think about how we move forward, um, I tend to think of at least three key elements um, that are part of this. And 
I'm going to present them today um, in essentially reverse order. Um, not necessarily reverse order of importance per se, but in terms of where I think we collectively need to be placing greatest responsibility for such things. So the first thing that, that um, I work very hard to advocate for is collective action. The, the community coming together to support one another, to try to deal with um, the forms of hate, um, harassment and toxicity that we see online. Um, and, and so just as a, a practical example, um, after, my, after I personally um, had a, a very dark experience with a large scale campaign of harassment directed at me, um, I found that you know, in order to make good out of that, in order to feel empowered, I needed to build a network um, of other women who now actively track um, and watch out for these things happening to others and then offer ourselves as a support system, reach out and say, here are a number of things that we could do for you. Let us know if you would like right, any or all of these things. So they include tracking the harassment. So an individual who's being targeted at the time does not have to feel like they need to be in the weeds monitoring all the things that are coming at them. Um, so tracking those, reporting them, keeping logs, uh, reporting to the police as appropriate and so on. Um, we have different forms of intervention that we discuss with, with those who are, are being targeted um, and let them ultimately choose the ways in which that we might intervene on their behalf. So there's this sort of collective right, um, response that we can, uh, we can engender. Um, the second is really about platform design and policy. Um, and so, of course, this goes, goes directly to some of the things that we're talking about dealing with Wikipedia, um, but touches on all of the, the major online and social media platforms that um, we, we operate within. Um, but before we can get there to really designing the best um, platform affordances, um, before we can design the best platform policies, we actually need a great deal more research. And I would argue we need uh, a great deal more research that centers those who are actually targeted by hate and harassment. Um, so far, a lot of the work on how we change platform policies has been, has lacked that context, has lacked an understanding of how those who might be impacted are actually going to respond. Um, and in some cases, I think there are backfire effects to that. And then the third and final thing um, is that we need to really push for institutional support. Um, as an academic, right, um, I see that universities provide very little, sometimes no support um, for those who are being targeted. Uh, women journalists um, are receiving very little institutional support. And so ultimately we need to put the responsibility on the institutions that gain real advantage from us as women having public voice and yet then don't themselves take responsibility when our actions right that benefit them backfire and have negative consequences for us. Wow that is powerful work that you're doing. Thank you for the direction that you're providing here. Before we go into q and I, um, I want to kind of shift just a bit because I know this work can be frustrating and the truth of what we're facing that all of you have shared here today, while it's inspirational, it's also heavy because um, the change is not happening as quickly or as urgently as we think it needs to and as the, we know the world needs it to. And so with that being said, for the last question, I'd like for each of you to just give me um, a very brief thought on what makes you the most hopeful about this moment and about this work. And then I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Anusha, who will handle the volume of questions that we have coming in for all of you. So let's, let's do a quick round robin and let me know what makes you the most hopeful about this movement and this work. And I'd say for me, it's been hearing all of the great work and the direction that you all are doing. Thank you. So I can start. I would say a constant source of inspiration and like that's hopeful for the work with art and feminism is the art and feminism community itself. 
Um, we actually put out a community care statement in November, just kind of recognizing that where we are, right? We're in, a, we're in a pandemic. We have this kind of like racial awakening that's happening um, around the world. And just giving our organizers the space to perhaps not organize an event this year, just recognizing where everyone's at, right? So we put that out in November and we kept touching to it and just pointing to it and really like encouraging people to take time that they need. Um, and despite all of that though, we still have over a hundred events this year happening around the world, which I think is truly incredible and truly inspiring that this community, even in these times is still committed to this work. I'm happy to hop in next. I think I am deeply inspired by how many incredible women and in particular women of color you see uh, launching new nonprofit uh, and, and for-profit media organizations seeking to sort of reclaim the narrative, whether it's uh, Mitra Kalita, formerly of CNN, who has just started URL uh, Media, which aims to elevate um, you know, uh, ethnic media and, and journalists in those communities, whether it is the two incredible women, uh, Lauren Williams um, and her colleague Okoto, who just started Capital be, which is um, aimed at serving the Black community. Um, I am just super excited to see um, uh, women sort of, you know, just grabbing onto their narratives and launching new platforms um, aimed at serving uh, not brand new audiences, but audiences that haven't been served. And for me, it's very similar. Um, academia can be a brutal competitive environment. Um, and for me, the, the real um, optimism comes from seeing a younger generation of uh, scholars stepping into this space and recognizing um, how problematic that competitive spirit is and rather focusing on supporting and lifting one another up. I actually see um, academic institutions shifting fundamentally, um, I think, within the next generation based on that ethos. I just want to say thank you again for allowing me to host a, a dialogue with you all. I appreciate all of the great work that you all are doing. I would like to um, turn this over to my colleague, Anusha. She's going to ask some questions of you all, and I'm just going to be listening in. This is fantastic. Thanks, Janine. Thank you so much, everyone. This has already been such a great discussion. We do have several questions from the audience and we're gonna try hard to get to them all. Please use the Q&A feature to submit your questions and make sure to note if there's a specific panelist who your question is addressed to. Uh, and let's kick off. Uh, so the first question that I believe is relevant for most of our panelists is, um, your panelists are all female. Will we succeed in addressing the structural barriers that exist if we keep leading the conversations without having male champions? I live in Africa. When people talk about gender, they just sideline it as a women's issue. How do we bring men into the conversation more so they become part of the solution? Kira, do you wanna kick us off? Sure. So I would say also like some of the messaging that is in art and feminism is that all of our workshops and all of our the work that we do is open to all gender expressions. Um, I also want to uplift that our leadership team um, does have representation um, across internationally and also across gender. So we um, specifically to this question, uh, we have someone on our who is a co-lead organizer, um, Mohammed Sadat Abdullah, who is based in Accra, Ghana, um, and his pronouns are he, him. Um, so definitely we can't, you're right, we can't do this work alone. And we definitely need allies to, to help this be more than just a women's issue. We definitely need allies, um, but it, it can be tricky at times because we also recognize um, that we at times need spaces that are for right the for women, um, uh, anyone you know identifying um, as a woman to to come together and talk through our experiences so that we can then share those appropriately with the wider world, including allies. Um, but absolutely, gender is not a women's issue. 
Um, it is a human issue. Um, and we need uh, allies. And in particular, I think we need allies because um, men can very frequently reach other men more effectively than women can. Um, so yes, more allies, please. I don't think I can say it much better than either uh, Kira or Rebecca just did, so. Great, thank you. Um, so I think this question uh, would be great for both Emily and Janine. I'm struck by the slow progress in who creates information and media and who is visible and shown in information sources. This is a similar problem in so many sectors. What are uh, examples or ideas for how we scale up change in terms of representation online? Janine, you wanna start? I'll start and I'll speak from a, a Wikipedia platform and then I'll turn it over to you maybe for the broader news. I can, <laughs> excuse me, thank you for the question. You know, when I think about the work that we're doing at the foundation in support of Wikipedia, it, it, this question leads me to our, both the universal code of conduct and the thriving movement. And what I think is that in order to ensure that we have a broader scope of participants and information, we need a diverse community of people building that content and that information. In order for that to happen, people have to feel welcome. I started the conversation with saying, in many cases, I am the first, the only, and very different in every environment. It doesn't mean I like it that way or I feel comfortable with it. I've just gotten used to it. And by creating a universal code of conduct where we are driving our community to live into the values of welcoming that we support as a foundation, I think it's a way for us to ensure that who we are as a movement uh, will embrace truly what the world looks like so that we have a, a strong spirit of inclusion and the content and in, in the information that shows up on Wikipedia is a reflection of the people in the world and not just 1% of the world uh, you know, showing up and, and writing for uh, multiple perspectives. I believe so strongly that the experience that many people have with people that they don't know or others comes from things that you read and see and, and it's the media. And so uh, I believe strongly in our responsibility and our obligation to create a thriving movement, a community where everyone feels welcome and included and their thoughts are all, and perspectives are all, are taken into consideration. And that's one of the, um, one of the many things, and it's a big thing. So there are a lot of things that we're doing with our products and with our brand and um, with our technology to support the thriving movement, but to me, all roads lead that way and then create a space where, where we can do our part in that. So Emily, maybe you can speak from the, the broader news perspective. Sure, I mean, people ask me a lot, um, you know, why I didn't try to effect change from inside a major organization, existing organization, like why I started something completely new. And my answer to that is, I think that in order to, to level the playing field, we really need, look, it, it takes forever to turn an ocean liner. It's really fast to turn a speedboat. And I think we need just like a hell of a lot more speedboats who are able to make really immediate action to really add um, to the national dialogue, to the national narrative. Yes, I, I think we're seeing the sort of um, the wheels turning in these big mega institutions. There are major conversations happening around, around race, around gender, around inclusivity. Um, but I don't want to wait for that change. I want to be part of a solution right now. Terrific. Thank you. Um, I think this would be a great question for Dr. Trombull. Uh, I study women in politics specifically, and I'm curious in terms of institutional support, how do you think political institutions can support women in government who are oftentimes disproportionately targeted online? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think it starts from um, a, you know, what may sound like a um, rather instrumental place, but I think is really crucial. Um, I think that any institution, whether it's a government, political, academic, um, media institution, needs to have a clear policy and effective statement of support rooted in that institution's values, ready to go the moment that um, any of its employees, 
uh, begin facing this sort of, of abuse and harassment. Um, simply publicly saying that we back this individual has a really powerful effect um, on the, the larger discourse um, online. So that's step one. Um, but step two is making sure that there are um, a number of people on staff within the institution who are ready to actively respond. Because it actually shouldn't be, and remember when I went down my, my threefold list, I said that I was doing this in reverse order, essentially of importance, but um, it was more reverse order of responsibility. Because what we see far too much is it becomes the responsibility either of the individual or of a community, right, a grassroots community to provide the support. Every single one of the, the tasks that um, my grassroots network provides for women who are being harassed online can and should be provided by the institutions. Um, they can do the monitoring, right? They can do the reporting. They can be reaching out and providing the services, right, to the individuals um, facing harassment. So essentially what I'm arguing for is flipping the, the roles and responsibilities that we see taking place now. It's wonderful that we build the community-based grassroots support for these things, but we need the institutions to be taking those precise same actions. Terrific, thank you. Um, so I think this one is good for Kira and Emily. As has been said, one of the main issues with writing about women and non-binary people on Wikipedia is lack of coverage in media sources. How can Wikipedia help journalists to write about women? Kara, you want to jump in? That's a fun question to think about. How can Wikipedia help journalists write about women? I mean, we because Wikipedia really relies on a lot of the journalists to, to because um, to create Wikipedia articles. Um, but I think how Wikipedia as an institution could help is uh, revising reliable source guidelines, being uh, enabling us to use things like oral histories um, to create articles, as I was talking about earlier, would be able to, it would just open up so more, so many more resources to bring some of these, these um, artists to the pages of Wikipedia. I think that's a great answer. Um, and the best answer, honestly, to this question, I think, you know, there might also be some ways that that Wikipedia and, um, and news organizations, particularly some of these startup news organizations could work together to highlight, you know, we're telling stories about incredible uh, women and LGBTQ people who are doing really fascinating things who might not otherwise believe that they are worthy of a Wikipedia page, right? Um, like there, I think there could be some really interesting collaborations there on ensuring that the people who we're elevating, the people who other news organizations are elevating are also finding their way back to to um, getting established uh, pages that, that reflect their work. So uh, that's an interesting concept and I'd actually love to talk further about that. Thank you. Um, we're right at 226 at the moment. So I think that we only have time for one more question and I'd love to hear the answer to this question from all of you. Um, you've all discussed focusing on writing about communities and hiring women. But how can journalism and academia ensure this writing is not surface level and properly depicts and describes women, especially Black, Indigenous, and people of color and LGBTQ plus women? Hire those journalists. I mean, to me, that's the easy and obvious answer is to ensure that your newsrooms uh, accurately reflect the diversity of the nation. Um, and I think that that's, that is first and foremost, the way that you're gonna know you're getting those stories right, that they're gonna be in depth, that they're gonna be thoughtful, that they're gonna reflect true lived experiences. Um, uh, there, there's not a pipeline problem, um, you know, go out there and look for them, you can find them. It's all, it's all about recruiting. And I'd, I'd love to add to that too. And it's, I think it's more than just having a seat at the table, right? Because like, if the seat at the table is in a table that's room already suffocatingly white, then the seat at the table means nothing. So I think it's also not only hiring and inviting people of diverse backgrounds to be part of um, part of like those decision making groups, part of being a journalist, part of being in the academic groups, wherever your spaces are, but it's also I think the responsibility 
of um, organizations to provide that DEI training and not a DEI training that's just like, all right, well, I've done my diversity inclusion, so we're good now, y'all, but keep that training ongoing because we're in a world and a landscape where we're all constantly learning. We're all constantly not only learning, but unlearning our like colonialist ways and white supremacist ways. And so we need to constantly be doing this work together of our learning to be able to really create these not just surface level um, descriptions. And I would add to, to both of those thoughts that in my world in particular, studying things like um, disinformation online, really the, the scholarship um, that drives most of this field is focused on big data, big numbers. Um, and, and that focus on data tends to um, paper over difference. Uh, tends to um, be report on findings that are averages. Um, and we're not going to learn the important lessons from, uh, diverse com from diverse communities by simply looking at averages. So one of the things we have to prioritize is research of a qualitative nature, research that actually is designed from the beginning with these communities at the table, right? In conversation, asking, what are the questions you would want me to be asking as I dig deeper into these things? So we need to bring people to the table at different steps within that much broader pipeline. Anusha, if I could add uh, one thing to this, I've been taking some notes and um, you know, it's been a rich conversation in how we're making progress um, but I've heard a few things that we need more of, and I wanted to, to capture them and share them. So, you know, we need more focus. We need more allies. We need more journalists. We need to hire them. Um, we need more disruption. And we certainly need more speedboats. And so um, with that, I, I just want to encourage us to not give up. I hope that uh, the folks in this, in this panel and that have joined this discussion will stay in touch. Um, following all of us on social media and, and pinging us with some of the tough questions and some of the wins so that we can celebrate the wins and dig into the challenges. And um, with that, I just want to say again, thank you very, very much. And I'll turn it over to Anusha. Thanks, Janine. Thank you for all your questions in the audience. I know we weren't able to get to all of them, but you can find us on social media and we're happy to continue this conversation. Thank you so much for joining the Time for a Rewrite panel. Um, and like I said, just follow us on project, hashtag project rewrite on social media for more. Thank you.